um, OpenStack as a service. And if you want to start by telling us why OpenStack at Internet. Sure. So um, we definitely have orchestration, plumbing. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Okay. So at Internet, we, you know, um, we were actually one of the first, if not. Hello. It's on. <laughs> Maybe. There we go. So at Internet, we were actually one of the first. Ministry of Sound. <laughs> Try this one more time. I'll just hold it like this. <laughs> All right. So at Internap, we were actually the first um, public OpenStack uh, based cloud. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Let's try this one more time. Um, so at, um, Internap was actually one of the first, if not the first, uh, company to deploy OpenStack back in uh, 2011. And at the time, it was really uh, immature, so it was kind of uh, an adventure for us. But the thing that we were always attracted to by Internap is just the idea of a fast-moving open source project um, where, which allows us to concentrate our development resources and all the, uh, the cool stuff that we're trying to do above and around the plumbing orchestration platform. We really have no interest in you know, developing the core orchestration platform, right? So just like you know, Linux, just like Apache, it's all about writing coattails, right? I mean, Internap is a publicly traded company. We're 700 people, but we're still you know, a, uh, a speck in the face of companies like AWS from a resource standpoint. Um, so from our perspective, OpenStack is really attractive because it allows us to build on top of, extend upon, um, you know, kind of use to um, provide our vision of infrastructure to our customers, um, and essentially, you know, time to market. That's really it in a nutshell. Can I get the uh, clock turned back on, please? <coughs> so, um, given that you're using essentially a standard orchestration platform, how do you differentiate what you do from what other cloud IIS providers do? Sure. So, you know, we definitely offer a public cloud. There's a few things that we do given who our customers are and, you know, our um, sort of our approach to, uh, to infrastructure in the market. So, a few things. Um, we have a lot of co-location customers. Um, these customers are generally struggling with trying to make their infrastructure more agile. They're kind of enamored by all the, uh, the promise that the cloud holds, but they're restricted because they want control. Um, they want to spend the CapEx. They're basically server huggers, right? So they want to keep their, uh, their servers under their own lock and key. So one of the things we're using OpenStack for is essentially allowing those customers to, you know, call it private cloud, call it like an enhanced managed colo, but essentially bring agility to a more traditional, um, you know, service offering. Um, other things that we're doing, um, you know, one of our most popular products is, uh, is a bare metal server, which is basically, a, you know, no hypervisor, no virtualization, but just a, a raw server with an OS. Um, and we basically use OpenStack um, and have extended OpenStack to essentially be able to provide um, bare metal service on demand, um, you know, just as another flavor. So our customers can basically, you know, provision um, both virtualized and non-virtualized resources. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that we're doing. We're also doing things, um, you know, related to networking. So we allow people to extend their layer two networks. It's kind of about um, bridging the old school and the newfangled, right? Because it's really, this transition is really interesting. We actually think the most interesting opportunity isn't on the extreme cloud-only side of things, but is actually helping, um, you know, these two worlds that are colliding. And so what's the typical use case you see amongst your customers for OpenStack? It really, you know, as a service provider, it really, you know, runs the gamut. Um, you know, anything from, uh, I mean, key verticals for us would be things like uh, ad tech, gaming. Um, you know, we've, we've even got some uh, educational customers. Um, really, you know, any customer who is running infrastructure at scale, they're interested in OpenStack in one way or another. Even if they're not interested in using OpenStack specifically, they're interested in the advantages that, that it can bring. Um, you know, agility, automation, consistency, um, you know, that's key. Um, here's an example. Um, you know, we have co-location customers that have deployed a lot of VMware. Um, and I think Ken was talking about something similar um, to this, but 
it's really common for these guys to have such a long provisioning time, even though they're fully virtualized, to the point where the network department and the application owners are in two different worlds, right? And the application owner doesn't really care. They just want their server. And from their perspective, it's a commodity service. They're able to swipe their credit card on Amazon. So why is it so damn hard for them to get capacity internally? And oftentimes, you know, they'll put in a request for the server. The server will be all automated, but yet it goes to the internal network people. And they sit on it for days because, you know, assigning IP addresses and VLANs are so complicated, I guess, right? So basically, they're interested in, you know, more agility, more automation, and the things that OpenStack enable, the value that OpenStack provides are in those areas. They're not necessarily looking for OpenStack in of itself. So you mentioned developers swiping their credit cards at Amazon. What pulls them back into an OpenStack ecosystem? I think um, we have a term for it that our salespeople use. I'm not sure if I'm a fan of it or not, but we call them the Amazon graduates, right? It's very easy to start on Amazon, but costs can spiral out of control. And that's not a, that's not a, um, that's not meant to be disparaging against Amazon. I think the same thing can be uh, said for just about any public cloud provider, mm -hmm. ourselves included probably, right? So a lot of it is cost, whereby they realize that if they have a baseline workload that's always on 24 seven, um, you know, no matter what study um, or benchmark <laughs> public cloud providers uh, publish, uh, it's not cheaper than doing it in-house. So that's probably one of the big drivers. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you're saying they're not doing it in-house, but they're still doing it with you, correct? Yes. So you're running the OpenStack-based cloud. Correct. Why is it, do you think it's substantially cheaper to get a cloud from you rather than getting it from someone like an Amazon? A few things. Um, one is bare metal. Um, you know, I think the, the, the dedicated server industry um, has different you know, pricing dynamics as the cloud industry. Um, there's no virtualization tax. There's no noisy neighbor issue. Um, there's no co-tenancy at all. Um, so that's one. Um, and then two is just the ability to leverage OpenStack on infrastructure that the customer owns. So essentially helping them, you know, build a more uh, automated, agile co-location infrastructure or, you know, similar to a private cloud. Okay. And how many of your customers have tried to do things on OpenStack to build their own OpenStack-based private cloud before coming to you? I think a, a, fair, a fair bit have. Um, you know, I mean, it's so theoretically accessible that there's a very low barrier to playing around with it. But I think people, people assume it's a product or assume that it's more productized than it is. So their first attempt to kind of stand the whole thing up and you know, get a proof of concept going, especially if they're doing it themselves and they don't have really sharp systems people and network people and DevOps people, it doesn't tend to go well. They get in over their heads. Um, you know, so we've definitely had customers before coming to us who, you know, tried to give it a shot and have, have basically failed. Um, but I think that's going to change over time, you know, as the whole stack matures, um, as the installers get better, as the distributions get better. Um, you know, but for now, it's, I think it's a pretty high bar for someone, especially if they're not a technology company, to, uh, to implement it themselves. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about how, how difficult has it been for you to implement OpenStack as a service provider at scale? It's been fairly challenging. I mean, we've definitely had uh, you know some missteps. Um, you know, like I said, we got started in uh, late 2011. Um, you know, with the Diablo release or even the Cactus release. So you know, for for the, for everyone who's following, that's like uh, you know ancient in terms of OpenStack land. I don't think even the most uh, you know perhaps only the most optimistic uh, OpenStack developers would have called Cactus or Diablo production ready. Um, but um, you know, we kind of got going with it. Um, we also just acquired a company called iWeb at the end of last year, um, and they're completely punching above their weight. They're already in production with a, with a public OpenStack cloud in Canada. Um, so now our development teams are uh, combined with iWeb. So we're kind of, uh, if anything, doubling down on our commitment to OpenStack. Um, we've also got our own beta uh, as InterNAP for a next generation cloud that we launched last year. Mm -hmm. So a couple of disparate efforts that are all hopefully going to culminate in a, uh, in a major new release for us uh, in the first half of this year. And so how much are you relying upon OpenStack essentially for the capabilities versus how much are you building yourself? So we're building a lot of things around OpenStack, but we're definitely relying on OpenStack for all the, the core capabilities that it you know, provides. I mean, we're fully consuming things like Nova, Glance, Zinder. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're using other vendors that are uh, you know, in the OpenStack community like SolidFire, but we are also adding a lot of, um, you know, call it surrounding orbiting ecosystem-like tools. Um, you know, like our own uh, billing platform, monitoring, you know, integrating with OS, our OSS, BSS, um, you know, adding some of the bare metal and hybridization capabilities that I mentioned. Um, but we're definitely consuming it, um, you know, in full, um, and we're extending it sort of to, you know, put our vision of infrastructure 
you know, and expose that to our customers. Um, but you know, 100% of our go forward infrastructure platform is OpenStack uh, powered. Yeah. And for you and your customers, who is important in your ecosystem that's related to OpenStack? Um, so we have the belief that if, uh, if you're operating a public cloud, um, you really need to have the internal capability to kind of pull the code, um, you know, make changes, uh, have you know, internal development capabilities to you know, do that. Um, so we're not really using um, too many vendors you know, from a distribution or consulting standpoint. Um, but we are certainly using vendors who are playing in the OpenStack community. Um, you know, and that's definitely an advantage to us if they have integrations um, or if they have some sort of commitment to the project. Um, you know, so uh, vendors like uh, Solid Fire or Arista or you know, some, of these, uh, some of these other vendors are, are definitely interesting to us. But you know, while we are using specific uh, you know, commercial vendors and partners, let's not forget that one of the most attractive things to us about OpenStack is the fact that it doesn't lock us into anything. Right? I mean, every single component, whether it's storage or network or you know, the underlying servers or uh, you know, just about anything can be swapped out. So the fact that it uh, you know, basically avoids lock-in for us as a service provider, aside from the fact that it, it avoids lock-in for our customers, is hugely appealing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of you know, who your, par your customers are using, are they using folks like RightScale, for instance? Uh, some of them are, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And what we've really, um, you know, kind of been pleased about over the last couple of years is the ecosystem of tools that actually integrate with OpenStack has really blossomed, um, you know, over the last couple of years in particular. I think when we first launched um, our first version of the cloud back in 2011, just about every tool that claimed to integrate with OpenStack actually integrated with the EC2 compatibility mm -hmm. API, um, you know, which was kind of, uh, you know, a bummer from our perspective. But um, at this point, um, our customers, while they don't necessarily have a tool that is OpenStack only, their ecosystem, whether it's RightScale or Scale Extreme or you know, even Fog or Chef or Puppet or whatever, these tools are all fully supporting OpenStack now. So it's like a checkbox for them, you know, rather than some homebrew system. How big is your typical customer in terms of the size of their OpenStack deployment? Um, it, it varies, but our, our sweet spot's definitely people at scale, meaning they have hundreds and hundreds of physical servers. Um, you know, we certainly have customers that only have a single VM, but that's definitely not our sweet spot. Our sweet spot is uh, people who are, you know, the so-called Redshift users, um, you know, generally underserved by Moore's Law. Um, you know, they're sitting there banging their fists against a table that uh, Intel only, you know, increased their performance by 20% this year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's people who are scaling out rather than scaling up. Yep. No worries. Um, what eBay is doing with OpenStack? So I, I can start a bit. So uh, in 2008, we started developing our own um, private cloud, and uh, the main driver was Agility. At the time, there was no project like OpenStack, so we had to do our own. And um, when OpenStack started to mature, we looked at all our options, um, and we started uh, adopting an open source um, cloud to replace our in-house custom uh, cloud management system because it gave us uh, many uh, av advantages uh, compared to a proprietary in-house solution. So we, we are using it uh, in three main categories of projects. We have uh, developer projects, developer cloud if you want. Uh, we have QA uh, and um, the analytics and then we have also production uh, in some area. So what's your role been at eBay in all of this? So my role, mm -hmm. um, I'm chief architect for the global cloud services that is developing a cloud across uh, eBay Inc. So oh, I'm the uh, architect for storage and PayPal, but our teams are now merged together. So we're developing the, the PayPal side of that question was eBay is doing the OpenStack deployment. And PayPal, before I started this year, wanted to go faster. so they made their own OpenStack deployment. And we had the advantage of not having as many legacy things to deal with. So we could start Greenfield and, and do whatever we wanted. 
So now, now that we've succeeded in that, we're combining back together and trying to re-implement everything together. So my, my focus is on storage and uh, mostly Cinder and object storage. So when you're looking at these use cases, what made you decide to use OpenStack? What else did you consider using? So I can talk a bit about that. Um, uh, around like two, two or three years ago, um, we tried to find partners to develop our cloud. Uh, we talked to many uh, software vendors or virtualization vendors, and we also looked at uh, cloud.com before they were acquired by uh, uh, Citrix. So the, the main reason why we, we selected OpenStack uh, was first uh, the architecture, which was very uh, distributed. Uh, the language is also a plus because uh, we can find developers much more easily than Java, even though we are a Java um, we are Evian Java developers at eBay. The community, I think, at large uh, is uh, more attracted by languages like Python than Java. And also the size of the community as a result of all those um, uh, benefits. So for us, uh, the, the main um, uh, decision point between the two was who is going to win at the end, and uh, that was, uh, the indicator was the size of the community and the ecosystem that was started to build around OpenStack. Same thing for you? Sure, I, I was brought in actually as an OpenStack developer specifically because they'd already chosen OpenStack. So for me, it's, that's the focus. Mm -hmm. And so tell us about sort of the, uh, the initial experience in deploying OpenStack, what was that like? Did you want to take that one? What were the challenges that you saw? What went well? What didn't? Sure. Um, pretty much everything, I at first, it's, it's nice and friendly. And then uh, you get to a certain size, and you find a lot of issues. Um, so our experience has been successful finding solutions to those issues and then trying to work with the community to find out if our solutions are the best or, or are going to be supported in the future. So. Um, in that sense, we try and stay close to the, to the community trunk and not fragment off our own fork because we're trying to leverage that. And I think that's a big piece of, of uh, not going with a vendor solution completely is having something that's supported by the community and not supporting everything ourselves. So you're not using a vendor distribution at all? No. What were the challenges that you encountered more specifically? Oh, um, I think, as, as you mentioned earlier, the, a lot of the vendors say they interoperate, and they don't really. Mm -hmm. um, things of uh, running out of uh, resources and uh, systems that were scaled to maybe go to 100 instances, we go to 1,000 or 10,000 instances, and things don't, don't work so well. Um, for example, in the architecture, I don't know if we want to get so technical, but uh, in the queuing system, uh, uh, all of the hypervisors are sending updates of their statuses and, and how much availability they have. When you get to 1,000, 10,000 hypervisors all going through the same queue, things get overloaded and, and things can't happen in the time they need to. And we end up with strange errors because the code isn't designed to catch something that doesn't quite happen the way it was expected. And you end up with a lot of limbo sort of things. So that's sort of just, when things get big enough to burst at the seams, that's where we're running into trouble. So you're running a solution at scale. How big is your solution today? Uh, so I think we, we can uh, answer in partly. Mm -hmm. So um, our bigger uh, OpenStack deployment is 500 hypervisors on virtual networks using quantum. So that's uh, uh, one deployment. Um, and uh, we have uh, in other data centers uh, multiple of uh, deployments that are running uh, different use case. Um, and we are looking at consolidating those uh, deployments. The size is uh, multiple thousands uh, hypervisors, um, more or less distributed uh, across multiple data centers. So how much operational effort does it take to keep this OpenStack cloud up and running happily? So the, it depends if you are just talking about um, the operations of the OpenStack components. Uh, at the last summit, one of my colleagues uh, did a presentation that OpenStack is not cloud. OpenStack is just uh, the automation system or the, the framework that allows you to operate a cloud. But there's many other things that are uh, going around OpenStack, like monitoring, like uh, all your processes around um, capacity management, fulfillment, all of that. 
And um, for us, uh, this is something that we used to do before uh, because we were running our cloud, uh, original cloud. So we, we have a system, for example, for onboarding full racks of compute uh, servers uh, automatically and converting that into OpenStack compute. So for us, this was not a gap. It allows us to very quickly add capacity, for example, to an OpenStack open cloud. But I can imagine that someone without those capabilities would have much more efforts to, to spend on this type of um, activities. So the, the, the answer is, is it depends. It depends on your existing uh, capabilities. So adding some uh, OpenStack to already mature uh, processes and operations is not so much of a stretch. But if you are starting from scratch, I think that uh, th there's a lot of things to look at, and um, it can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. What have you found to be the most effective way to engage with the community? Which community? The OpenStack open community. <laughs> oh, um, we, have, we actually have uh, employees who are on the, the various teams. Um, we attend the summits. Uh, we're involved a lot. It, you actually work directly on some of the committees. Right, so we, I'm part of the and user I think committee. that's important. Um, we, we have uh, tried to foster new projects, uh, participating into existing projects, following very closely, either directly or through some of the vendors that we, we are using. So we have multiple ways to, to contribute back to the community. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the main um, recommendation is that um, Someone that de deploys a cloud should make sure that if there's any customization or anything like that, they, they quite rapidly uh, push back to the, the community, because <laughs> otherwise they, they kind of develop this uh, technical debt that accumulates, and every upgrade is going to be more and more complex because of all those customizations. So right now, um, we, we don't have like a metric to know how many changes we we keep in-house versus what uh, we push to the, the community, but we, we, we have no more than 10 uh, like changes that we did in, in OpenStack uh, for our own uh, use cases. So that's the range that you want to look at. If you go much higher than that, upgrades are going to be a nightmare. And how do your users interact with OpenStack? Are, the, are you using um, the Horizon portal? Have you built things yourself? Are developers are using a lot of the API? But, sure, tools? that's kind of interesting because uh, at first people think of it as Horizon, the GUI. Um, and then you may know about Asgard, the uh, Netflix's version. PayPal has ported that to, to control OpenStack. It's an interesting thing. Um, but the command line tools, the CLIs, are also, if you're really going to do anything, you can't click 100 times to launch these things. It just is crazy. So you quickly end up going to that. But we've gone beyond that to where we're integrating in with uh, APIs directly. We have a, a tooling system that was used to run with our old virtual uh, provider that would make um, what we call stages, which is PayPal in a box. And we, we've, the developer pushes a button because they need a new dev environment. And they push the button, and like, oh, a day or so later, they get their development environment. With the OpenStack, we've moved that down to like 10 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big win for everybody, and they can make as many stages as they like. And they just use the same tool that they used before because the API calls uh, go to Horizon and Nova and such instead of to mm -hmm. whatever it was. So before. your developers don't have to mess with that directly? They don't know. Right. Yeah, so and, we have two types important. of users, though. Mm -hmm. We have users that are um, looking at efficiency. They don't want to deal with infrastructure, and they are going to use platform-as-a-service tools that we have. And, and those tools are integrated with the OpenStack APIs. But there are some developers that are trying to innovate and want to be more agile by trying to, to figure out new ways of doing things. And those, they will develop their own like pass layer almost on top of the existing OpenStack API. Mm -hmm. Or they are, they'll use the UI that is provided, either uh, Horizon or another custom one. Mm -hmm. And we have like, there's a legacy kind of uh, developer, maybe used to using bare metal and uh, you know, storage services in an old style versus the newer companies that are being acquired that use all Amazon services. So they're used to using uh, S3, and they're used to using EC2 and Elastic Block Store. I think over the next couple of years, that'll be the standard. All the new stuff will be, all the kids coming from school use Amazon, and they'll know that'll be what people are asking for. Right now, we're more pushing to the architects that like, are really bright guys that develop the, the applications the company's using. They don't know about Amazon. It's just some sort of thing. And now the company's <laughs> asking them to use it. 
So we're trying to show them why it's faster, better, they can do more. And that it's sort of a tricky problem yeah. to, to get the more experienced people on board because cloud is just a bunch of buzzwords to them. So, so uh, Surendra from Park, would you come up? Do I move back? Yeah, let's get out. <laughs> <laughs> so, could you tell us a little bit about what your organization is doing with OpenStack and what your role in that is? So, I work for a company called Park. I think most of you are aware of it. We invented the models. It's GUI. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I work for Park. Oh, no. The same problem. So, I manage a bunch of researchers uh, at Park who are on the big data side. So we have a requirement to run the parallel algorithms at very large sets of data. So we look at different solutions like Amazon Web Services. We looked at uh, uh, Joint. We also looked at uh, VMware. And, uh, but our uh, researchers are not programmers. They are not the DevOps guys. I don't have any engineers to do this uh, automation layer. We need something. We roll it in. We should be able to start working without any programming effort. So we went to Nebula, guys. We provide the OpenStack distribution. That's where we started back in early 2012, the first time with the, S uh, the SX distribution of it. Mm -hmm. So our use case is primarily for big data applications, getting a lot of sensor data, run a lot of algorithms at very large scale, running maybe hundreds and thousands of models automatically, score them, pick the right model, and then give that to the actual business analyst to really fine tune it. So we do a lot of automation frameworks through the rendering, visualization. So we need lightweight containers which we can execute without really taking a lot of deployment time. Mm -hmm. And also zero administration, zero DevOps, zero programming, and no system admin. Mm -hmm. I only have six people in our support team to support 250 PhDs. Mm -hmm. So that's where OpenStack really helped us a lot to you know, just automate some of the layers through the, some sort of chef scripts or puppet scripts. Mm -hmm. and give the tool to the researchers to really focus on their primary research. Mm -hmm. And so what's your role? I'm a CTO for cloud and big data research at Park, And I manage a bunch of PhDs around high performance analytics and also high performance computing and big data and also looking at a lot of sensor data that comes in through a lot of Xerox projects. Mm -hmm. So you've built a, a bunch of additional tooling on top of OpenStack. Yeah, we built the whole framework to enable the researchers to, you know, with one push button, I should be able to deploy. We call it disposable Hadoop cluster. I can launch a 10 terabyte Hadoop cluster or Hive or, you know, take Spark cluster or any of the big data tools chain. We can really deploy it in less than two to three minutes today and then run our experiments and tear it down when we are done. Mm -hmm. So that's not possible doing either in Amazon or any other cloud services. So you're still using the Nebula solution? Which one? You're still using the Nebula solution? Yes. So we have three controllers. Total, we have 50 nodes in production. So we started the project. It's a long journey, actually. Nothing worked in the beginning, but uh, at the end of the you know, 12 months, everything turned out to be very nice. Mm -hmm. We started in 2012, April. Then we went to uh, production in uh, 2012, November. Mm -hmm. So a pretty short journey. Then we upgraded that to the, the Falsum uh, early 2013. So now pretty much on Falsum right now. We're looking to migrate to the next version. So Nebula has done an amazing job for us to put some people on site to help us really you know, fine tune some of those things, <laughs> fixing some of those uh, core capabilities when you, for example, see name assignment, and a pretty simple thing, uh, the changing the passwords, or security groups, some basic terminology problem to people came from Amazon, mm -hmm. you know, using Amazon Web Services. How do I really use this with a new lingo and uh, a new tools and new terminology? Aligning all these things is really a big challenge for us. So you're still on the Fulsome release, which means that you're two, almost three releases behind now as we get, go from Havana into the Ice House time frame in April. Are you finding the pace of OpenStack six months to be challenging in your organization, or what's causing that? Yeah, it's really a big pain in the neck to upgrade them. <laughs> <laughs> when we upgrade from SX to Fulsome, we lost all our images. We had to redo everything because there's a format change and the glance doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. So those transitions are really painful. So with the Falsum, we stay on Falsum because that can do 90% of our work. Mm -hmm. We're not really chasing after all the new features coming in, uh, in OpenStack. Mm -hmm. So we love to go with uh, all the virtualization, uh, network virtualization techniques. But uh, for now, I think it's good for us to do all the big data research. Mm -hmm. it, it does my work, so why, why should <laughs> I go with the versions? <laughs> so you mentioned that the initial implementation was very challenging. What made it challenging? 
a lot of things. So first of all, you know, rolling that in, just uh, configuring the IP addresses, uh, you know, security groups especially. And some of the APIs have the hardwire uh, parameters. For example, I can only create 10 security groups. A lot of our automation scripts create hundreds and thousands of security groups to really partition those uh, parallel running processes. So when you really hit those hard limits, and I cannot change those variables, I need to call some of the vendors to, oh, can you change those variables? Oh, no, you can't change it. It's a hardwire in the system. So we don't want any of those hardwares, and I want those things to be controlled by the higher level application layer services. Think of that as a TCP IP, right? So how much of code is hardwired in the TCP IP layer? <laughs> Provide the higher level and application level does all the magic. So that's what we want the open stack to be. You give me the control to program it the way I want it to be programmed. So then give me all the flexibility to turn all naps. Mm -hmm. So what, are you, what do you most want out of OpenStack? Right? Or pr probably perhaps a question would be, what would be compelling enough to cause you to want to go through the upgrade cycle pain? Can you repeat the question again? Well, um, you, know, you, you mentioned that there wasn't anything really in the subsequent releases that you really felt you needed. Um, what could OpenStack do that would be compelling enough to want you to, for you to go through an up, upgrade cycle? Zero loss upgrade, just roll it in the new version. It should work seamlessly without mm -hmm. redoing anything. For me to rebuild, for example, we also work with SAP HANA. So mm -hmm. our uh, the OpenStack, uh, the base deployment is a very complex one. I have 50 node clustered wow. altogether, out of which I have 27 node Hadoop cluster, which runs 2.5 petabytes of uh, data analytics platform. And I have four terabytes of SAP HANA sit next to that. And then I have computational framework, which is basically OpenStack based. If I make any changes to any of these things, I can't really roll in all these images, hundreds and thousands of them, and upgrade them within a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I need a zero downtime, zero maintenance, risk-free. If you can do it, I can take it. If I can't do it, I can live with the existing version. It does my <laughs> job. <laughs> all right. So what has the ongoing operational experience with OpenStack been? So once you've gotten through the sort of initial hurdles and the upgrade, what's the day-to-day -day like? It's pretty good now. Earlier, the maximum half-life of my cluster was seven days. <laughs> After seven days, everything disappears. Then all my images gone, everything lost. The story starts all over again. Now, actually, we're not even looking into that. No one knows there's Nebula running there. It is so seamless. People go and as if it's available to them and just uh, punch in a bunch of... Uh, commands and they're operational, they do their job and just go. And what's going to be necessary to get you to adopt OpenStack more broadly in your organization for more than those analytics workloads? Yeah, we're looking at the next big step is, you know, we're working with a couple of hardware vendors to create the innovation center, open innovation lab, by basically democratizing the, the data-centric algorithmic research by bringing even all the Xerox researches into that, you know, we have around 700 plus PhDs across the globe. How do we really bring them to use all these, you know, they don't want to spend time really dishing out the VM. Who wants to really dish out the VM? I wanted to really a, a service provisioning versus VM provisioning. I don't need to spend my time. Typical our data, you know, data research applications, you know, it's very complex hierarchical applications. And I need to spin out maybe 200 HPCC application agents to process the data in parallel. And that has to scale out automatically without really me adding a note to that. Mm -hmm. So that will save a lot of time to our researchers. Mm -hmm. So our next step is to take this, expand it to the much uh, the higher level so that even our researchers and other labs could get access to that. Mm -hmm. And second thing is we're also trying to bring the customers into that. It's a secure cloud. We have two regions in the cloud, which is one is the public cloud, other is the secure cloud. So what we do is all the edge computing is done in the public cloud. So it's a private public cloud, surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> it's on our own VPN. Mm -hmm. So and then the internal cloud, that's where all the data fusion takes place. So we, that's a very secure, and we built around the, the ring of security controls. We do all the data processing there, and the insight is delivered to the edge. That's where the applications get built. So we want customers to bring, connect their sensors, connect their you know, the devices into this network, and use the park researchers. We have 250 PhDs in Palo Alto, you know, as backdoor research, can do a lot of interesting algorithmic research, can you really take it to the market to commercialize or productize or democratize those innovations? Mm -hmm. That's our next goal for OpenStack. And to do that, are you going to be continuing to write your own tools, or are you going to be uh, considering bringing other commercial products or other ecosystems? Solutions? Actually, I'm also, you know, opening up, inviting a lot of these past vendors. Uh, recently, I invited uh, Scholar guys to come and try and connect us with the Google Compute Engine, also Amazon Web Services, mm -hmm. to a kind of a bustable computing mode. 
and also cumulogic guys brought in their past to try it out with the nebula. So basically I'm opening up for people to come and try your application, see if that is you know, something help our researchers, our customers, our vendors, our partners. So it could be win-win for everyone. So you're still comfortable using external public clouds as well as using... No, because you know, a lot of security requirements. Right? Oh. If we, we do a lot of applied research for our customers. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of the data governance requirements. If you, if you read the Amazon 50-page terms of use document, <laughs> it will never pass through Xerox legal. Right, so I don't want to spend two months reviewing the document. Instead, focus on solving the problem. So bring the data into the park lab. Then our researchers can focus on finding solutions and then give the insights to our customers. So the data is secured. I don't need to go through the data governance pane. And everything is contained in the, the park lab. So that's easy for us to manage. Good. So going back to the group as a whole, um, if each of you were to give one piece of advice to other companies who are looking at adopting an open stack based solution, what would it be? Can I start? Sure. Set your expectations correctly. Don't <laughs> promise, you know, boil the ocean kind of thing. Pick the use case, well defined use case with the tangible ROI. That's what we did at PARC. You know, we shown to our, we're doing a massive project for LA, we're basically doing the dynamic parking assignment, very complex project. So they were actually setting up their missions, taking you know, two to three months to set up a mission, configure it, and show the demo to the customer. So we went to them, you know, your lead time is two, two months. Can I reduce that to two hours? That's a compelling value proposition. Mm -hmm. So at that point in time, all we are giving is dishing out the VMs, provisioning the application into that, solve their pain, reducing the two months to two hours or three hours, whatever that is. Then they get, aha, that's really exciting. Let's go to next project, next project. So you can set those expectations and keep progressing because there's so many unknowns in the open stack. You don't know what you are getting into. Mm -hmm. You don't want to expose yourself unnecessarily with all the risk factors by promising too much. Yep. That's a big lesson we learned in Park. Good. So I think I have to. Um, the, the first one is that you have to really make sure that you understand why you are trying to build a, a private cloud versus using a public cloud. I think that. Um, if it's, uh, like you said before, just an extension of a virtualization platform with self-service, um, maybe the value is not worth the, the, the pain, if you want. But if you, you understand the value proposition that a private cloud is going to bring to your organization, I think that it's better um, and, and you understand a bit more what features you will need. And the second advice is to hire the right, the right persons because um, Traditionally, in enterprise, uh, system administrators are not used to the type of um, pro uh, components that OpenStack is using. It requires a lot more application on the, the code that they are used to do and a different mindset. And we found that um, we, we had to almost like train people to this new, uh, new world and hire the, the right engineers. So it's right mindset um, up front. I'd continue that and say that um, in the past, you've been able to hire people that are specialized in network or compute or storage, and they all have to understand a lot more about how it all fits together because it's all running in the same machine. Um, but further, OpenStack isn't uh, a package you just buy and turn on. You, you, it's more like a, a set of tools for craftsmen who know what they're doing to use. Um, you have to have people who know how to use the software. Um, I think it's really important that companies deploying OpenStack figure out the, uh, the process and the cultural implications of what they're doing um, before and kind of get that scoped out really well and understand you know, what changes they're going to need to make internally to support um, you know, that kind of installation. Um, and then from the technical side, um, we've seen uh, some people attempt to uh, stand up OpenStack and use a very reactive manual systems administration approach. They're not treating their infrastructure as code. They're not using configuration management. Um, you know, they're treating it like one-offs, just like they, they're doing with the rest of their infrastructure. And if they're doing that, they're just in for a world of hurt because things are just going to get inconsistent and you know, fall, fall over very, very quickly. So, yeah. Questions from the audience? You do need a mic. Here you go. I just have a question about, um, in production, do you have any challenges using uh, networking as it stands right now? Do you just use flat networking because of the scale, or do you have to use additional software? So f uh, on our case for networking, we have two models. Uh, we are using um, 
uh, VMware uh, NSX. So uh, most of our networks are virtual networks. And um, we have uh, production networks that are uh, bridge networks. So our networking model is maybe where we spent uh, most of the time on OpenStack. And we were one of the early adopters of uh, Quantum, now renamed Neutron. So I would say that um, this is maybe uh, one of the components of OpenStack that uh, is the most challenging because out of the box, uh, it's difficult to, to have a production deployment without additional um, components. Okay, we've got one in the back. Hi, my, my name is Udi, private call. Uh, thank you for the insights. Uh, we've heard uh, about many obstacles and challenges uh, with re that relates to network uh, and other aspects, uh, skills, expertise. I wonder, I haven't heard anything about uh, security, especially knowing that uh, in the OpenStack world, uh, compromising a node could compromise the whole uh, stack. Uh, what can you share with us about uh, con uh, security considerations? So we, we can take that. Um, do you want to talk about the sure. PayPal side? Um, you know, uh, PayPal, of course, security is very, very important. Um, everything's vetted by our security teams, and uh, they're, they're in agreement. Everything's uh, kosher. Um, we do uh, tenant networks. We do um, lots of firewalls and things to segregate our data and our traffic and, and things like that. We haven't really run into specific No, so issues. I think that OpenStack by itself is not solving any security yeah. or adding more security edX that you would have otherwise. I think it's uh, maybe what is missing in OpenStack is uh, a blueprint on how to deploy OpenStack in various compliance uh, environment and a kind of um, a, a reference implementation, if you want. But otherwise, uh, we didn't find a specific uh, issues beside HTTPS support uh, missing in some components, API, and so on. But otherwise, it, uh, it more goes to what I was saying before. It's not a package you just install. You have to know what you're doing. It's very yeah. easy. You can install it totally wrong and and be very yeah, insecure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing within OpenStack that'll make that inherently more secure or less secure. I mean, if at the end of the day, your virtualization you know, layer is not secure or you have you know, problems with individual servers or hypervisors, those problems are still going to exist under OpenStack. And OpenStack doesn't even attempt to um, you know, define how to fix those problems. Those problems are still you know, very much there and uh, are left as an exercise to the reader, sort of speaking. Okay, we've yes. got some additional questions over here. Uh, also, for those of you that are online, um, please go ahead and uh, enter your questions into uh, Twitter. OE Forum is the hashtag, and we'll make sure we get them answered for you. I, I've got a question on OpenStack storage performance. Um, have you ever run into any storage bottlenecks, and what workloads were sure. causing that? And, and did you, do you have different performing storage elements in your infrastructure? Um, I'm not, yeah, okay. Um, generally, the, the problem that uh, some of the architects say, developer architects, would have a question about is performance because it's virtualized, so there's extra layers of hop. One of the specific examples would be, say, uh, Cinder with its block storage. Um, it maps it through the hypervisor. If you're using an iSCSI target mapped through the hypervisor to your VM, wouldn't it be faster just to connect directly with your iSCSI? Uh, we've done some measurements, and we don't see any significant, you know, one, two percent, perhaps, uh, because the VMs, the hypervisor is not doing that much. But I really need to see more uh, measurements, and I haven't seen any white papers or anything. Maybe other people know more. In general, it's the the benefits of having the automation of the storage deployments and the abilities of flexibility you get outweigh any sort of performance impact. The performance impact is negligible. Yeah, for the data intensive applications, we did notice significant difference. When we run the Hadoop applications on the OpenStack with the virtualization on the storage side, and we, we saw actually almost 40% degradation in the performance. For example, we did run the TerraSat algorithm to see how it runs on the bare metal versus the OpenStack. We saw at least you know, a good uh, percentage of degradation in the performance. And actually, we're working with uh, Nebula guys to see if we can able to mount those volumes directly as the data node, so which can really accelerate. I don't need to really do the pass-through to the you know, virtualization. 
also other alternate we are exploring is the single root IO virtualization, SRIO, to see if we can directly attach through the pass, uh, pass throughs into the device so that I don't need to really do the virtualization overhead there. The same thing with the networking too. We have the workloads that span across both network storage as well as the compute. So when you have the mix of these workloads, actually we have a research team focusing on the diagnostics. What they do is they go and measure your workload characteristics and see how can I really optimize placing of these jobs so that you know the compute intensive job will not go into the hypervisor where it is contending for the network and storage resources. We got pretty good uh, improvements by doing that placement optimization that built on top of OpenStack scheduler to see how we can really, and basically using some sort of affinity flags, I want this job to go to this particular the hypervisor so that I can distribute the jobs with the dynamically through the algorithmic way versus uh, randomly distributing it. Yeah. We did a lot of optimizations at the, the, that layer. The earlier version of OpenStack, all jobs first goes and you know, fill in everything first and then goes to the next hypervisor. That's pretty random approach. It doesn't really work very well for the complex job scenarios. We want that to be kind of a random so that you can just spray all the jobs. It go randomly to the different systems. Then you have the random mix, so that's the first experiment we did. Second thing, we took that the algorithmic mix optimization. So I can place the jobs based on the work characterization. I think so, storage is really a, a major pain point on the public cloud, particularly network attached storage. And it's not just bad performance, it's inconsistent performance. And performance that varies over time of day or you know, what day it is. Um, you know, from InterNAP standpoint, we've done two things. One is on our network attached storage, if you look at the traditional vendor landscape for people who you know, sell SANS, there are actually very few people thinking about how to enforce you know, QoS on a per lun or per tenant basis. SolidFire is one of the you know, few companies that are, that are doing this. Most enterprise SANS don't address that at all. Um, the other thing we're doing is we, you know, we offer bare metal. So essentially the SSDs or the, the disks on that server are just dedicated to that customer. So, there's just no you know, inconsistency issues at all. But I completely agree with whoever asked the question. I mean, storage and, and consistency of storage performance is a huge problem on just about every public cloud. I think you also have to take into account the architecture. Um, we use ten, bonded 10 gigabit networks uh, off the hypervisors to pairs of 10 gig switches. Everything's 10 gig. If you're doing this with one gig networking, you don't want network attached storage. It's just going to be a bottleneck. Uh, it, that would make a total difference. If you've got a traditional, you know, all of your machines set up already using one gig networking, that would totally change your plans on how you're going to allocate your space. Um, but that said, 10 gig networking is getting much, much cheaper. Copper, uh, SFP plus cabling is really cheap. Uh, it's definitely the way to go. We're going 40 gig networking bonded soon. So network storage is, I think, the, I'm biased, I'm in storage. But uh, network storage is, is the future of storage. Okay, we've got a couple more questions that we want to get answered. So uh, being here for two hours so far, I still have no clue. What is the state of OpenStack? Could you guys offer us uh, you know, one single slogan, like let us know what is OpenStack trying to accomplish? You know, like Linux. <laughs> we all know Linux is open source Unix clone. What is OpenStack, you know? <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure we're the people to answer that, but um, I, my quick answer is it's an open source virtualization uh, API specification. What's it trying to accomplish? So for us, I can answer what OpenStack is doing. OpenStack is the cloud management system that we are using for implementing either private or public clouds. For example, uh, PayPal, eBay, and other companies I've worked at, we've had uh, deployments of the data center. We shut down the data center and do an audit of the machines and find some of the machines have never been used. They were allocated very carefully in projects. But five years later, no one ever even logged into them. No one ever pushed code to it. But they got lost. So we end up with 10, 20% of the machines never used. If we could use that allocation for other projects before we found out that they were not used, we'd save millions of dollars a quarter. So this OpenStack source code is the way that the company is implementing that uh, virtualization instead of going to a vendor and being locked into that virtualization. I think you can Does also. That help? Yeah. 
I think you can also look at OpenStack as the, the open source vehicle that has the potential to knock many billions of dollars off the market caps of companies like VMware and Amazon. Well, you know, I, I mean, that. that's not a, I don't mean to be pr provocative about it, but I mean, that's really, I think, the expectation, you know, is it's a, it's, it's a democratizing open source, um, you know, thing, right? I mean, framework. It gives you options, it keeps the vendors honest. Right. And also, it offers the great programmability, right? That's one of the things. You, can you program the hardware? Microsoft did it through the HAL to make the Windows work with all the drivers. But after that, there's no innovation available openly for to program the network switches, programming the routing philosophies, or you know, able to partition the hardware into slices. There's OpenStack, I see it as the TCP for the cloud. And then you can build nice applications on top of it, the same lingua frank for that, you know, what Amazon is doing or other cloud service providers are doing, it provides a uniform language and syntax and semantics to talk to the hardware. One final question. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, do you guys use uh, chargeback? Do you do chargeback on your OpenStack oh. environment? And uh, if yes, what do you use? And are you happy with it? So I, I know where the question is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, JC. So, um, uh, I'm sure the others will have different, uh, depending if you're a service provider or if you're an enterprise. Uh, but f what we do is we cannot do chargeback uh, the way a service provider would do because of uh, the way our uh, finance uh, system is built. So what we do is uh, almost like prepaid plan for um, cell phones. Um, organizations are transferring budget to our organization at the beginning of the year. So for example, uh, uh, like the MyEBay uh, group, we'll have uh, that much uh, CapEx for, for the year for new projects and so on. So they would transfer that money to us at the beginning of the year. And then we would provide capacity instead of providing uh, like previously uh, instances of um, uh, server instances, we would provide just compute capacity on demand. So we, we pull this, uh, those resources into one uh, large um, common infrastructure, and we then offer it on demand. So we, we don't do directly the typical chargeback, but we do a showback to show how much they consumed out of their allocation, if you want. So we, we are not doing cellometer right now because we, we used to have, so today our cloud, as I explained, um, is 90% uh, uh, on our um, legacy uh, cloud software, and we have our own mechanisms to do capacity management, showback, and uh, cap um, this type of activities. But we will definitely look at, um, for the capacity that is on OpenStack, using Silometer for tracking the fine grain usage, which our other software is not doing for this cloud. You are a very popular audit or very popular panel, so we're going to squeeze one more in. Thank you. Uh, my question is, how do you back up the huge data in eBay? Oh, sorry. Yeah, how how do you back up the data in the cloud? So um, what we do is we bring compute to the data. So we have very large clusters that are holding uh, most of our um, warehouse data warehouse. And uh, we, um, a bit like a, kind of a placement um, trick, we provision capacity closer to where the data exists uh, on the networks where the data is located, basically. We ask the NSA for a copy of whatever we lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we also use a cluster FS to you know, mount those data sets closer to the compute node so that you don't need to do any kind of uh, moving the data around. OK, big round of applause for this panel. Very many thanks. Okay, thank you all. Um, just to get 